Got your Bibles? Let's go to Mark chapter 12 and be looking at uh, verses 13 through 17 today. Mark chapter 12. Good to uh, have uh, everybody back. We had quite a few that were uh, traveling, and and uh, we had some people actually visiting last week from out of town, and uh, that was a blessing and an encouragement as well. Sorry, Charity's not here with us, so we got the kids in here and. I guess if the sermon's real boring, you do what I did as a kid and count light fixtures. Although uh, in here, there's not a whole lot to count, so I guess you can count them about ten times, and that'd probably get you through halfway through the service. So, anyhow, that that was meant to be funny, but I don't know if it was really that funny. Uh, Mark chapter 12. Before I uh, read, I want to kind of recap just a little bit from last week, just so we're kind of set up for where we're at. Uh, if you're here last week, uh, you remember we uh, talked about uh, Jesus using a parable, and this particular parable was a man who owned land. He uh, basically got this land ready to be used as a vineyard. He built uh, a protective fence. He built uh, towers around it and leased this land out to to some guys, and and he sent some of his servants to go get fruit that was rightfully his to be given to him, and uh, those uh, guys greeted the landowner's servants with some violence. They uh, beat the first guy, the second guy, they wounded him pretty seriously in the head, Uh, the the third guy they killed, and then finally he kept sending people, and finally the landowner said, I'm going to send my son. Surely they'll be nice to my son. They sent the guys, he sent his son, and these guys took him, killed him, and threw him out of of the vineyard. And uh, the U.A. say, why are you talking about that? Because uh, before we continue on, we need to understand the very severity of rejecting Jesus. And that's the whole point that he was illustrating with that is is that it is important to reject Jesus because we're, we're put here on this earth and he wants a relationship with us. You're here in church today. You're around believers. You're more important uh, than that. You're, you're being given the word this morning and, and he wants us to respond to those things and he wants a, a relationship with you. He doesn't just want you to show up and, and, and check off your box. He, he wants a relationship with you. He wants worship, which uh, encompasses everything about you. Uh, your, your worship involves your, not just what you give and not just singing, although those are important things. I don't want to minimize those this morning, but He wants us in every facet of our life. When we're on our job, when we're in a classroom, uh, even when we're uh, uh, on the highway, driving as as distracting as that may be, He wants us to worship Him and honor Him uh, with our entire lives. And uh, He doesn't want us to reject Him. And rejecting Him brings severe penalty as we saw last week without uh, recapping uh, too too much. I've already said too much about last week. But let's pick up at verse 13 this morning and read down to verse 17. Uh, And they send unto Him certain of the Pharisees, uh, and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teaches, teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it, and he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. title of the message this morning is simply, Jesus deals with hypocrisy. Jesus deals with with hypocrisy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask that at this time that you would uh, uh, take your word, use it for your glory and your honor. Help us to understand that you don't just want uh, sacrifice or just worship. You want a relationship. You want us to be wholly surrendered to you. 
I pray you would uh, use the rest of this time to draw us closer to you. Bind Satan from this place. May he not have any influence in uh, what's to come. And uh, help us to seek you. Help us to truly worship you uh, with all of our being. And may we not compartmentalize. May we not be fake or, or uh, uh, hypocritical. May we not be lukewarm as we approach you this morning, as we desire to pursue your will for our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I came across an interesting question this week. It asked, have you checked the labels on your grocery items lately? You may be getting less than you thought. According to the U.S. News and World Report, some of you are nodding your head, you know where I'm going with this, some manufacturers are selling the same size packages we're accustomed to, but they are putting less of the product in the box. Before I go any further, you ever had that happen with chips? I love potato chips, by the way. And I I think I got an amen there. I'm just just messing with you. Um, uh, there's times I pick up that bag and I look at the weight and I'm feeling I'm like, this don't feel right. I am not getting what I'm paying for and I'll put the bag back. But anyhow, um, for example, a box of well-known detergent that once held 61 ounces has been known at times to only contain 55. Same box, less soap. Am I right? How something is wrapped doesn't doesn't always show us what's on the inside. That's true with people as well. We can wrap ourselves in the same packaging every day, nice clothes, a big smile, a friendly demeanor, yet be less than what we appear to be. You know, the, the title of the message, Jesus deals with hypocrisy, that word hypocrite, because we see here in verse... Uh, um, uh, I lost my place here. In verse 15, knowing their hypocrisy, that word hypocrite, we understand that. uh, And we understand it more than we probably realize because that idea of hypocrite is somebody that's an actor. Have you ever met an actor that's exactly like their character? In fact, you would be shocked if you actually met an actor. They are nothing like their character. Uh, some of you may have been a play in school and, 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 and maybe you were, hopefully you were more than just a tree in the background or whatever, but maybe you played a part in a school play and you memorized lines and you had to use certain facial expressions that you wouldn't normally use. That's the idea of acting. And that's what Jesus is dealing with people if you paid close attention to the reading, knowing these uh, groups knowing that these people are trying to catch Jesus in a, in, a, in a way where they can twist His words, or trying to catch Him in a lie. These people are being very hypocritical. They appear to be on Jesus' side, but we, we know better, don't we, that these people don't mean Him any earthly good. So the first thing we need to see this morning about Jesus dealing with hypocrisy, and maybe what we need to understand as we deal with hypocrisy, as it's sent toward us, We need to understand the plan of the Pharisees. The plan of the Pharisees is our first point this morning. If you look in verse 13, And they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. There was a strong desire by these groups to destroy and discredit all that Jesus was doing. Jesus was a very great threat to their skewed religious system, a system in which they preyed upon those that were desiring to truly worship. If you read Matthew 11, we won't take time for that this morning, but it was a system there that was designed and it was skewed to prey upon people trying to worship, taking advantage of that desire. Uh, Psalm 38 and verse 12 talks about the plan of a hypocrite when David writes to us there, they also that seek my life lay snares for me. The people that sought after David's life, they were laying snares, they were laying traps. Somebody that does not mean you well is going to lay, lay snares and lay traps for you. We know that Satan it walks about this earth as a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he may devour. It doesn't say he's going to devour certain people. It doesn't say he's going to devour some and leave some. Seeking whom he may devour. He is desiring to get all that he can get this morning. I don't want Satan to devour you. Even as a believer this morning, you may say, I'm saved, I've trusted in the Lord to forgive me of my sins. I'm trusting Him for salvation. That doesn't mean Satan's done trying to devour you this morning. In fact, the fact that you are saved 
is you're the type of person Satan has got his bullseye on. It's kind of like if you have an impact player on a football team. And uh, I remember uh, playing a game in, in college one time where uh, I kind of surprised some people. They didn't think I had certain abilities at that time. And I, and I played pretty good one game. You know what we played again? I got double teamed. There was a bullseye on my back. And the same goes for you, friends. When you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, Satan is going to do whatever he can do to lessen your testimony. He's going to do everything he can to lessen the impact you might have on another person. So, so one of the things I tell people when you make a decision for Christ, if you, whether it's you're going to rededicate your life, whether you're going to get baptized, whether you surrender to God's call to preach, you surrender to be a missionary, I always tell people, expect Satan to come after you this week. Expect a battle. Expect a trial. Because he, Satan does not like any time you make a decision for the Lord. Think about just coming to church on Sunday morning. I know this has never happened to anybody here. How many times has there just been trial after trial on Sunday morning? You wake up, hot water heater's out. <sighs> That's just one example. Or a uh, flat tire on a car. Or uh, the list goes on and on and on. When you make a decision, go to bed Saturday night, we're going to be in church, we're going to go worship, we're going to go into the house of the Lord. And you wake up, 7.30, 8 o'clock on Sunday morning, situation after situation, Satan trying to keep you from getting here. Maybe that's never happened to anybody else. Maybe I'm the only one that's ever had that happen this morning. We see this plan of the Pharisees, Psalm 38, 12, we'll finish reading that. Uh, David said about them laying snares, and they that seek my hurt speak mischievous things. People that seek to harm you, they're going to speak mischievous things and imagine deceits all day long. That sounds like somebody really not meaning somebody very good time, does it? We see with this plan of the Pharisees, it started with a strange alliance this morning. Matthew twenty-two fifteen tells us, that uh, then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him, speaking of Jesus, in his talk. In this instance, the Pharisees even consulted with the Herodians to trick Jesus. These two groups, you have to understand this morning, they hated each other. But they both felt threatened by Jesus and his teachings. Have you ever heard the phrase, an enemy of my enemy is a friend? That's exactly the type of philosophy that these guys adapted, or adopted, excuse me. They believed the Herodians were like, we don't like what Jesus is spreading, excuse me. And the Pharisees didn't like Jesus threatening their religious system. So these guys got together and thought they were just going to trip Jesus up. And the way they were going to try to trip him up was a strategy of words. The idea was to try to twist and turn the words of Jesus into inciting insurrection against the government that was in power at that time. Luke chapter 20 and verse 20 tells us about their strategy with these words. And they watched and sent forth spies which should feign themselves just men. So these guys went into the crowd. They were just going to kind of blend in. They weren't going to really go to Jesus. They were going to kind of first try to blend into this crowd. And it tells us that they might take hold of His Word. you ever known somebody like that? That when they're talking to you, they're just waiting for you to say something that they can twist. Something that they can turn against you. Something that they can somehow make you say something that you didn't actually say. They're not listening to understand. They're not listening to have a conversation. They're listening so they can plan an attack against you, so to speak. They're listening so that they can create some sort of conflict. These guys here, the Herodians and the Pharisees, they thrived on conflict. You ever known anyone like that that just likes to thrive on feuding and fighting? They figured that if they could cause enough feuding and fighting, they could just stop the work of the Lord. God's greater than any feud or fight this morning. We need to remember that. We need to understand that. We see here the plan of the Pharisees using a, a strange alliance, getting with those Herodians. Boy, when, when somebody hates another person, it is incredible the links that they'll go to. They'll get along with other people they normally wouldn't get along with. There are people today that are doing everything they can to lessen the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are people on television, my grandfather referred to them as the talking heads. They get together on these talk shows. They get together on, on the news and on social media and trying to lessen the Lord Jesus Christ. When in reality, in any other situation, 
They wouldn't have anything to do with each other, but they share a hate for the Lord. And they will share a desire to try to keep you from responding to that message this morning. We see, secondly, a phony presentation. The plan's in, in, in place there. They've got a strategy going. They've got their alliance. They, they go on with a phony presentation. Listen to verse 14. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master. Boy, right here, they call him Master. Do they really consider him Master? We're talking about people trying to catch the Lord in, in, his, in words where they can twist and, and try to uh, deceive. And they come to him Master. You ever had anyone come to you and say a real nice phrase starting off? So and so. So they say to him, Master, we know that thou art true. <laughs> Boy, this just makes me laugh when I read this. And carest for no man. Now they're not saying that Jesus doesn't care about anybody. They're saying that Jesus cares more about truth than just what a man thinks. And he says here, For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God and truth. Now here's where, here's where things get, get kind of squirrely here in their presentation. Is it lawful to give Caesar tribute or not? In the beginning of verse 15, Shall we give or shall we not give? When people pepper you with compliments, it's easy to let your guard down. It's easy for you to let your guard down when people pepper you with compliments. One Bible teacher had said, it is a mistake to place too much stock into... Huh? I don't think you want to play with that. That's not a toy. One Bible teacher said, it is a mistake to place too much stock in what others say about you, whether it be good or whether it be bad. In fact, I had a teacher in college that uh, one time said, uh, oh, you don't want that either. That's just a book. So, <laughs> thought she just wanted to be held, but I guess not. I had one teacher in college that uh, told us, he said, whenever you guys go preach somewhere as a student in college, he said, whenever you get compliments, he said, you make sure you say praise the Lord. Because he said, people will say things to you, oh, you preach greater than our pastor. And they'll pepper you with compliments. And he was trying to tell us as, as young guys, don't get caught up in that. So this phony presentation, this was an attempt to get Jesus to relax. When people are trying to give you all sorts of compliments, they're trying to get you to relax sometimes. Psalm 55 and verse 21, David writes, The words of his mouth were smoother than butter. Kind of reminds me of a term that I often use that I got from my father-in-law about certain people saying, boy, they're a smooth operator. So the words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. No matter how smooth and how suave that the guy sounded that David's talking about, David knew that war was in this guy's heart. It was a desire that was going to come out. And uh, his words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. So we see two paradoxes here, a softness and a harshness here. This is an attempt to get David to relax, but this was the idea here that the Herodians and the Pharisees, they were trying to get Jesus to let his guard down. Uh, we see also that it involved words that they didn't even believe. Second Chronicles 19.7 tells us, Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. Spurgeon said to pastors, It's always best not to know nor wish to know what is being said about you, either by friends or foes. Those who praise us are probably as much mistaken as those who abuse us. Benjamin Franklin, he said that the devil sweetens poison with honey. And uh, a man named Trapp, he said that here is a fair glove drawn upon a foul hand. There are those who will smile in your face and at the same time cut your throat. We see about also here this presentation. It involved a desired response. They were desiring to get a response. Their question asks about 
uh, uh, Caesar and, and should we give him tribute, should we not give him tribute? The response they wanted was not one of truth. They just wanted a response from Jesus that they could take and they could capitalize and that they could take and run with, so to speak. Uh, Luke 11 verse 54 tells us laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. They were trying to find something where they could make an accusation that was not entirely true. And in the last part of uh, chapter Luke chapter 20 and verse 20, the reason here was so that they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. That was their desire. Now, to, to, uh, to kind of give away, so to speak, what would happen, here's what would happen later. In Luke 23, 2, it says, And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. Did he say this? Did he say this? We'll see here in a moment what he said. We can answer this question in the last part of verse 15. Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it. And he saith unto him, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. We see here now the third thing this morning, the perspective from Jesus. The perspective from Jesus. So as we study this out, We'll, we'll answer this question that was found in Luke 23 too. That they may begin to uh, accuse him. We found this fellow perverting the nation, preventing to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the King. If you've, if you've got your... Uh, uh, we don't want to do that yet. Uh, with that one simple question here that Jesus asks, Jesus exposes the hypocrisy of their hearts. He also exposes... The words as nothing more than insincere flattery. He exposes their motives. Matthew 22, 18 tells us, But Jesus perceived their wickedness. He just didn't perceive wickedness. It says that He perceived their wickedness, the wickedness that was on their part. And said, Why why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Some people ask questions to, um, to grow. Some people... Ask questions just to ask questions or to start debates. We see that Jesus here uses audience participation in an object lesson here to address the question. Maybe Jesus didn't have a penny. Maybe he, this was a reflection on his poverty and his dependence on God and others for support. Or he did what he did to involve the people hearing actively in this lesson. What does Jesus do here? He also affirms civil government. What did, you may say, what did Caesar even do for Israel? Why would Jesus affirm civil government? Well, they built bridges. They built aqueducts. They brought in water. They provided protection. They provided a military presence. They increased the benefits of life. They gave peace. The Pax Romania kept the whole world of that time around the Mediterranean at peace. Uh, if you got your Bibles, let's go to Romans 13. And while you're turning there, just for sake of time this morning, listen carefully to these three verses, these two other two passages I'm going to read. Titus chapter 3 and verse 1 tells us, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. Obey the magistrates to be ready to every good work. And then 1 Peter 2 verses 13 and 14 tells us, Submit yourselves to every ordinance for man, for man's sake, of man for man's sake, whether it be to king as supreme or unto governors or as unto those that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. And now Romans 13, let's read seven verses from there. We'll get through this pretty quick. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, a ravenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must be... 
uh, ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues tribute to whom tribute is due. The Apostle Paul here is continuing what Jesus had already said here. Custom to whom custom, fear unto whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now what he's saying here also we need to understand is don't pay more than you have to. That balances the goal here. Don't say, oh, take all I have, government. Take all that I have, those that rule over me. But Jesus here reaffirms the role of government to collect taxes for its support because it is God's means for man's protection, man's uh, benefit as well, and his well-being. Somebody may say, well, what if the government asks you to do something that God forbids you to do? Well, there's a, there's a way to go about that. This morning, Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, Peter and all the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. So in in doing so, in obeying God rather than men, you go back to the book of Daniel and you read about uh, uh, Rashak, Meshach, and Abednego. They were told to bow down to an idol. They didn't bow down to that idol. They just stood there. But they weren't carrying signs. They weren't saying hateful things. They weren't telling King Nebuchadnezzar uh, how stupid they thought he was or that he was they weren't getting on Twitter doing silly things that people do on Twitter and Instagram. They just stood their ground. And they respectfully and they quietly honored God. So Jesus is saying here, give the coin to Caesar, but give your life to God. It is honorable for you to give your life to protect your country. But friends, God, but only God is worth living for. Jesus' answer tells us that Caesar does not have all authority. There are things that should be rendered to God alone. When the state treads on this ground that belongs to God, we are duty-bound to obey God before the state. Adam Clark writes that this answer from Jesus is, is full of consummate wisdom. It establishes the limits, regulates the rights, and distinguishes the jurisdiction of the two empires of heaven and earth. In closing, there was a man whom this will at first surprise us. This was a man that, as I'm going to read to you about, that he made free use of the Christian vocabulary. He talked about the blessing of the Almighty and the Christian confessions, which should be the uh, pillars of, of the new government that he was starting. Boy, this sounds good, doesn't it? He assumed the earnestness of a man weighed down by historic responsibility. He handed out pious stories to the press, especially to the church papers. He showed his tattered Bible and declared that he drew strength from, for his great work from it as scores of people welcomed him as a man sent from God. I think some of you know where I'm going with this. Indeed, Adolf Hitler was a master of outward religiosity and no inward reality. You know, friends, Hitler got up and waved a Bible. He said some things that sounded good to somebody going to church, but we know that that man had a wicked heart. He sought to destroy people. He sought to conquer in in a way that uh, uh, was not right. And you may say, "What what a harsh way to end the message this morning, friends." It's a it's a real deal this morning when we have hypocrisy. It's a real deal this morning when we reject the Lord Jesus Christ. It's real. We need to accept Him. We need to accept His truth. We need to not have that religious hypocrisy in our lives. We need to be true. We need to have an authentic relationship. We need to have a first generation experience with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. We can't depend on our mom and dad. We can't depend on grandma and grandpa. It's a decision each and every one of us has to make. And time's running out. That's why I'm standing up here this morning because time, friends, 
is running out. You may, whether you're young or old, our life is but a vapor. We don't know how long the Lord is going to keep believers in this world. So as we leave today, we need to come to grips with the fact, if I accepted Christ, do I have that authentic relationship? Does what I'm doing on the outside, does it match my inward heart this morning? I say that, friends, because I love you. I stand here and I care about you. I don't want you to go out into the world and, and reject Christ as you leave here today. I don't want you to leave here and have an outside that doesn't match your inside. Because friends, the Lord Jesus has loved you more than, than anyone in His building, anyone that you've ever known could ever love you. He hung on a cross for you. It was His love that kept Him there. It wasn't nails. At any moment, He could have leaped off of that cross and, and, and done His thing. But these guys that we're talking about, these last week we talked about the, uh, um, I think it was the Sadducees was the one that, uh, without my Bible being opened, that he was talking to. And this week we're looking at, at Pharisees and Herodians. Why do people get so angry at the message of Jesus? Go, go, to, go to a university and mention Jesus and see what kind of acceptance you get. You will, you will not have any. Go, go to most public places any, in any town, and just start talking about Jesus, somebody's going to get upset. Why, why, why would they get upset? I could talk about the Chiefs winning last night, and very few people are going to be aggravated at that. But if I start talking about Jesus, that ruffles feathers. And I want to say something that before we uh, pray here in a moment. Friends, we, we've got to let the Word get into our lives. You, you want to talk about how to put off hypocrisy? We've got to let the Word get into our lives. We've got, to let, we've got to let our little feelings sometimes get disturbed just a little bit. You ever put clothes in a washer and just run the water and dump the soap and just let it sit there? Are clothes going to get washed that way? Probably not. What happens to the clothes? Well, there's something called an agitator that has to spin. I, when I was a kid, of course now I've got a different washer. When I was a kid, I used to open the lid because I wanted to watch what was going on in there. Of course, now I've got a front loader, so I can look down and I can see the clothes getting turned around. But if you ever, whether you have the top loader or front loader, and you look in there, that agitator's going around. The water in that soap has got to get worked into those fibers of those clothes to get dirt out, to get the smell out. If I just pour water and soap on a pile of clothes, and I, and I just hope for the best, nothing's going to happen. So friends, we've got to let God work on our lives. This is why being in church is important. This is why being in the Word every day is important. To allow God to work on your life the same way an agitator and a washing machine works on those clothes. Are we going to, how are we going to accept the Lord as we should? How are we going to get hypocrisy out of our lives? We've got to let the Word work on us. And it's painful sometimes. We, I like my pride. We all like our pride. But sometimes we've got to... We've got to let the Lord Jesus take a two-by-four and and do some correcting. We don't want hypocrisy. We don't want to have a relationship that's just, eh, it, it is what I want it to be. We need to be wholly sold out to Him this morning. And I hope that before you even get to that point, I keep going back to it. I don't know why, but I'm led to go back there. Probably because I didn't do a very good job hammering on it last week. But uh, don't reject Him. Do not reject Him. Be sensitive to what the Word says about the Lord. Be sensitive to what God's Word says about you and me and all mankind. Well, I'm a pretty good person. Hey, it doesn't take much for me to stand up here and to say, you're a pretty good person. I can look at everybody here, and I know everybody here to some degree, I can look at you and I can say you're a pretty good person and, and, and really believe that. But what does God's Word say about us? Romans 3 says that there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 6 says that all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Friends, your best five minutes on this earth is not good enough. My best five minutes, it falls way short. But you know what? I've got Jesus standing in the gap. That's the only thing that's getting me into heaven today. Jesus standing in the gap, not my good works, not standing up here and trying to preach a sermon, but it's the Lord Jesus. 
You know what's going to help your marriage? You know what's going to help your situation you're in right now? The Lord Jesus. And not just accepting Him, but allowing the Word to get into you and allowing it to root out any signs of hypocrisy. Hey, we all, we all battle hypocrisy. Every single one of us in here does. If you say, I do not battle hypocrisy. Well, I want you to write a book for me because I don't know how to quite get that 100% out of my life. It's something we're going to battle every day as long as you have breath. Because no one wants to be made to look bad. Does anyone want to look bad in here? I don't think so. But you know what? The Word can help us to be genuine and have a right relationship with Him. Let's pray.